and thank you everybody for for joining us this evening um and uh, i i look forward to to um it's a bit interesting q a at the end but if you don't no, we're mind, not I'll, getting sound from them yeah uh so if you don't mind we'll 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 save the questions to the end um and 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 hopefully I'll, I'll pick them all up then so um so david david introduced the series last week when he was talking about linda's farm um i want to take a bigger bigger look uh, a bigger picture look at that um and kind of contextualize um what, what talk what what, De what david was talking about early medieval monasticism in the northeast um i want to take a bigger picture look because i think, think the, the phenomenon as a whole is interesting um because it, it, it's it's an example of in a period in middle ages when we can get to see the lives of normal people as well as kings and bishops and, and popes and people. Monasticism lets us see ordinary people doing ordinary things because they get caught up in the detail of, 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 of this phenomenon. And there's some, some themes in what I'll talk about tonight. And the two, the kind of, a couple of them are a, a belief and changes in belief um, and a tension between um, new religious practice emerging and who gets to define what a correct religious practice is um, and what the implications of that are. Um, and this all starts with, as early Christianity does um, in the Near East, even during Christ's lifetime, people were trying to work out how to make sense of his teachings in light of the context of multiple religions, including the Jewish faith and the cults and traditions across the Roman world. Ideas, people and practices were moving in, in lots of different ways. People were talk, talking to each other directly. People were writing to each other and people were creating things. They were creating texts, symbols and buildings that then were inter interpreted by other people. Within this diversity, there were multiple attempts to define correct religious practice and to ensure that this correct practice was followed. And one of the key ideas that emerged in this ferment of, 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 of religious inquiry was the concept of um, physical hardship being allied to spiritual purity. And this idea of asceticism, this, this physical hardship, um, people tried to apply in different ways. And um, one, uh, one type, type, type of, of, of religious inquiry sought this hardship by um, living, pre one presumes, daytime only, on the top of a pillar, and that's that's pretty extreme. Um, but there's another type of um, religious inquiry that went to the fringes of settled areas and initially lived there on their own as hermits, but then later on kind of groups of hermits, if you can have such a thing, um, developed. And these were the early monks. And we, 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 get, we, we can see these, these begin to appear when we get the early textual references in about the fourth century. Um, in, for example, the work of people of St. Anthony. And these early documentary references to monasticism use the language of the context in which they arose they talked about desert, waste and wilderness and these people living entirely solitary, ascetic lives. Now, we now know that we have to interpret dot references like that quite carefully um, and that these texts can't be read as straight history. And we need to look at them in their context. Um, and it's particularly complicated to inter interpret them because we, we have layers of um, attempts by the medieval church for religious reasons to uh, redefine how these stories were told through their texts and into the religious teachings. But we do have a source of a counter narrative um, in the archaeological rec record and interpreting these two types of um, evidence together gets us quite, quite interesting results. Um, and we now know from archaeological evidence, but also some very careful recent work by historians, that a lot of these early so-called desert monasteries weren't solitary and they weren't 
the picture that, that are received um, through the documents. A, a number of them we now know were at least on the edge of settlements, probably, and they look to have been, a number of them look to have been engaged in some kind of um, production, sort of craft, small scale craft production. We get an, in, an example of them here, for example, in, in the White Monastery, um, the work that's been done by Yale University. So if you can see my my um, my mouse, I'm hovering it over. That's the church there, the White Monastery. Here we get little. I think these are probably like like sort of storerooms or workroom, whatever. This this is the modern monastery there now. But this is on 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 the fringes then of what was a, an earlier settlement as well. So these these were, these monks were living together. On the, on the fringes of some kind of settlement. So when Christianity came to, to, to Europe, it came in, in various ways. It first came probably with um, through, through Roman networks. Um, and then ideas about how to practice Christianity um, were spread backwards and forwards um, because of the medieval world was highly connected. For example, the, um, the person, the man who founded the um, Twin Weirmouth and Jarrow monasteries visited Rome five times. Um, and Britain received its ideas about um, monasticism through two main routes. One was the route that um, David was talking about last week, the route um, from people like St. Columba, the kind of Irish or, or insular monasticism that came from Francia, from France, um, then to Ireland, Cumbria, Scotland, Iona, and, and then places like, like Lindisfarne. And there was another um, another pulse of medieval monasticism that came up more directly from Rome um, and was sponsored particularly by the Anglo-Saxon elites uh, and, and those are places like Whitby. So we get we get monasticism arriving in the north of England where it, it, it's kind of cultural its cultural code was was, was established in the desert of the um, Eastern Mediterranean, but that code had to be translated into very different physical contexts of Northern Europe where there weren't many deserts, we did, we did have lots of forests and we, also, we get early medieval um, monasteries, particularly on areas that seem that could be, that could have some kind of natural boundary. So also, we get them on, on coastlines, we get them on, on little promontories, we get them on um, semi, it's circled by rivers, but we get we still get this process of growth and change and diversification. We get clusters of monasteries as well. This is an area of um, North Yorkshire. Sorry, Paul, I'm I'm, I'm counting this as, as Northern Europe, I England. I, I, I'm a Yorkshire lass. I'm, I'm claiming I'm claiming Yorkshire as Northern. Um, so this is in, in, in the Vale of Pickering. Um, where we get the cluster, these um, some of them we only know from references in Bede, but we get really interesting cluster of mo monasteries. So we have um, Hackness up on the North York Moors, and then we have a cluster of monasteries, Lastingham, Kirkdale, Gilling, Stonegrave, and Hovingham. Um, and some of them we only know by textual references, or, or they'll be they're reused later and, and become um, uh, churches later on. So this diversity of um, early Christianity and diversity of monasticism uh, was, was a perennial concern for, for um, the medieval church who were concerned that people were fo following uh, the most, following the right route to God. Um, because if God is conceived of as being eternal and perfect, there only, could only be one path to God. And that was the concern. So the concern for the early church was that people were being were, um, were 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 not were not going to be able to find God because they weren't following the true path. So the early church tried to regulate what correct practice was in in terms of the wider church, but also in time in terms of monasticism. And we see that through practices, um, early leadership. So whether the individuals concerned actually did all of the things that were attributed to them 
is almost secondary. The church quite successfully um, helped the ideas of leadership um, grow through sharing the work of individuals such as St. Benedict of Nursia, who developed what he called a little rule written for beginners, but now we know it as regular, regular Benedicti. Um, and that became, he, he wrote that document in the sixth century, but it contains traces of work by earlier religious leaders, since, uh, including St. Basil and Cassian. But it's now attributed, um, the final version, it, it simply uh, goes under the name of the work of St. Benedict, but it actually, it, it, it's a composite of the sixth century. Um, and this text provide gui provided guidance on translating Christian values into arrangements for living in a monastic community under a rule and an abbot. And the text emphasized the importance of discipline under a rule as spiritual service. The Opus Dei, the work of God, was participation in prayers and services. So that monks need not go beyond the gates, monasteries were to contain all elements necessary to life, including water, a bakehouse, mill, and garden. One chapter implies that it was practice for some monks to labour in the fields, as this activity permitted relaxation in the otherwise strict time for their meals. Daily manual labour was also prescribed to counter idleness as an enemy of the soul, and this labour included reading aloud. Such work should not include any servile work, for such is forbidden, but instead work should be carried out in the kitchen or in the infirmary. And if you're interested in, in um, the rule of St. Benedict, there's some inspiring interpretation of that by uh, a nun who, who posts on Twitter under at Digital Nun, and she also has a website in which she plays the recording of um, one chapter every day from the rule of St. Benedict. So returning to where, where David um, took us to last week, you'll recall that um, the Viking raids at the end, very end of the eighth, but principally most damaging the ninth century, were really disruptive to uh, the monasteries on particularly those on, on, on the eastern coast that could be easily reached um, from a, a, a across the sea. The places, monasteries like, like Lindisfarne were severely disrupted um, and, and, and had to uh, sort of relocate. Following that, uh, there was a bit of a, not exactly, monasticism didn't die, but it was certainly at, an, at a low ebb. Um, but it was then re-energized in Britain and other parts of Europe during the 10th century. Now in Britain, this 10th century revival um, also adopted the, the 6th century rule of St. Benedict and, the, and started to talk in terms of a religious order, this service under a rule. So this is, this is a 6th century document, but it's used in the 10th century to define uh, correct practice. And this Benedictine monasticism in the 10th century radiated from, from Wessex with initially only a few outposts in our part of, of England. We get refoundations on new foundations at Durham, Wearmouth and Jarrow, and in Yorkshire by the late 11th century at Selby, Whitby and York. Now this is a very partial map of some monastic locations and these are only scheduled sites. A number of um, the minor sites that aren't scheduled aren't included. So many places aren't listed and, and nor does this include um, a number of, of, of earlier sites that really should be there. Uh, but this, this gives you an, an idea that by the high medieval period, there's, there's, there are 
monasteries, abbeys, priories, however defined, most of, across most of Northern England. But it was the Norman conquest and the Norman settlement after 1066 that, that provoked kind of an explosion in the number of um, abbeys. In 1066, there were about 50 male monasteries in England. By 1154, there were around 500. And this is part of a broader picture across Europe, where in, in a similar sort of period, and the high medieval, high medieval period, over 500 different monastic orders. This is not individual ho houses, this is over 500 monastic orders arose in Europe. So we've got this theme again of tremendous diversity. So there's lots of different ways that people thought were the right way to be a monk or to be Nuns were less talked about, but it's principally that the attention in the medieval church was principally on, on, on the men. Some, I thought some definitions would be useful here. So monks are those who recite divine office. Um, mendicants would, um, another tradition would not be fixed, but they would uh, normally be in, in an urban setting and live from arms. You get canons regular and clerks regular who, who will recite the divine office or uh, who are priests and friars as the ten, this is um, a movement from 13th century onwards who will be members of certain other religious orders. So that's highly simplified. So if you think behind that, there's 500 different monastic orders. That's highly simplified. I like, <clears throat> I like this image because it reminds us that monasticism is part of a tradition of religious practice that started well before the medieval period and, will, and, con and, consider, and continues to the modern day. So this start, lovely illustration from La Russe starts with the Romans um, and then we get this diversity, lots of, lots of clerics here. But it reminds us about the religious women, but it also reminds us that belief is not just Christianity. In this period, we're also talking about highly diverse um, religions emerging in other parts of the world. And a lot of the examples I'll be giving you from, from now on are drawn from the Cistercians because that's the uh, order I've been studying. But also it's, it's one of the orders that's attracted most scholarship as well. But just to just to give you the, the, the tail end of the timeline. So thinking about this peak of, peak of monasticism in the high medieval period, we then have the dissolution in the 16th century, a revival of interest of an antiquarian nature in the 17th century, and people like Dugdale, um, who started collecting documents um, and, and preserving the records of, of monasticism. We then, get another revival of interest in the 18th century. Um, we get refoundation of monasteries on, on English soil. I'm not sure about whether they made them in Scotland, but certainly the refoundations of Benedictine houses from houses in France. And we get what I think of as a kind of consumer interest in monasticism when we get the beginnings of the kind of modern, um, tourism and, and heritage trail when people would go and see uh, the, the, uh, the, they developed an interest in, in, in abbeys as, as interesting ruins and picturesque. So we get the picturesque and the romantic traditions in, in, in art and literature. And then we still ha have the theme of diversification because monastic tradition doesn't stay still and in the North York Moors, for example, there are two Eastern Orthodox monasteries in the North York Moors, and I find that fascinating. And also, sadly, another tradition of religious persecution. Now, these are members of um, the Cistercian Trappist order in Algeria who were murdered in 1996. And the case of their murder remains unsolved. 
So I just wanted to remind us that this is this is this is a tradition for, for, for which people were killed. They were they were persecuted. So now having having given you a very, very quick counter through the timeline or to, to, to go back and think about take a more archaeological focus on how we know what we know about monasticism. So a lot of what we know today has been dominated by texts, particularly texts that were generated in a religious context um, and until relatively recently were interpreted solely through a religious perspective and, and historians weren't as critical of that as they now are and they're much much more, more uh, critical and, and um, contextualize the religious text much much more thoroughly. Um, we also have a dom dom dominance of interest in the architect, the elite architecture of the monastic core, and this is an example of um, what became a pretty standard plan for the for the monasteries of the Benedictine order. Um, and this plan is taken from a ninth, ninth century monastery of Saint Gall in Switzerland, and it shows you um, what were thought to be um, the essentials. So we get the, the the monastic church there, it laid out on the east east west axis. Um, and we have a school, abbot's house, um, a leeching area, physician, chapel, infirmary chapel, cemetery, um, chickens and geese, barn, workman's uh, mill, um, animal houses, um, uh, and then up there, hostel where visitors who would only be allowed into that part of the um, the, the, the precinct? They'd be, the visitors would be allowed that far and probably no further. They might they might be allowed into the west, but but probably not much further. Um, and this focus on this core complex was one that was the the focus by early. Principally, there were architectural historians rather than archaeologists, people like um, Hope and Breakspear, who did work on Beaulieu Abbey, um, Sir Charles Pierce, who was a def uh, an architectural historian who, who directed the excavation of Breaver Abbey, was also an architectural historian. So that's what they were interested in, mainly these the buildings of the church and perhaps of the cloister. They weren't terribly interested in the rest of it, and they certainly weren't interested in anything beyond the precinct. Um, so thinking about who lived in a monastery and what do they do, um, when I started trying to unpick, unpick this, it got it got quite interesting because we know about religious um, the religious professionals. We know, we know about about the the abbot and, and the structure about who who did what. Not so much is written about all the other people in a monastery, but it's not not often. Um, made much of but there would be monastic servants and, and actually when 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 Riva was um subject to dissolution in the 16th century that the, the servants there on, outnumbered the religious staff there would also be lay brothers and lay sisters and these weren't unique to the cistercian order lots of other orders had them but it perhaps it was a cistercian order who managed to um codify what the life of a lay brother or lay sister would be, which meant that somebody going into a Cistercian Abbey as a lay, uh, lay person would have a clearer idea about what they would be doing. So that's perhaps why it was attractive to them. Some monasteries might have slaves admitted to them. We, we have evidence of um, slaves being accepted by Cistercian monasteries in post Reconquista Spain, for example. And I was surprised by that. But again, it's part of the context of, um, of the medieval world in which these places operated. Some orders accepted children um, as, as, as oblate. Cistercians didn't, but some orders did. 
So, so it's not just the monks in a the monastery. There's a whole system of graduate people doing quite graduated tasks according to their social status and their their, their place in life. Um, another major function um, before, particularly before um, the parish and before the modern uh, welfare state, a lot of monasteries were particularly early monasteries were responsible for pastoral care. Um, and in our part of the world, for example, we know of a hospital associated with Shap Abbey in Cumbria. Um, a lot of monasteries provided care um, for lepers by way of special leper hospitals. Monasteries also had an important function in preserving learning and teaching. Um, that the, um, the, the image on the right here is a, a reproduction of the Codex Amiatinus that was uh, the original of which that was produced at the twin uh, monasteries of Weymouth and Jarrow. And you can see the lady in the background, it depends how, how big your screen is, but that's Dame Rosemary Cramp who, who excavated. Um, so it's nice to have that image with both of them there. And the other image on, on the right is of a um, monastic school with the children. You see the parents dropping off the children. I don't know how, how permanently they said, said goodbye to them. As I say, some, some children will be accepted into monasteries permanently. So they might be admitted at the age of five or six or whatever. Um, places like, like Jarrow, so the, the manuscript production, so, so the manuscript, the reproduction you see there, that the original took, they reckon, about 500 calves. This is top quality vellum. So you need 500 calves. You imagine the, the number of cattle you would need to have in order to have 500 top quality bits of vellum. The other part of the context I wanted to mention here is the importance of patronage. And it's this patronage factor that I think is behind the explosive, explosive growth of monasticism in England after the Norman conquest. Because after the Norman conquest, we get this, um, we, we, we get the classic post 1066 settlement is we get, a, we get new manors established with a church and the larger areas you'd often get a castle with an attendant monastery. And you get these as a suite again and again across, across the north of England, across all parts of England. Um, and we see here religious authority allied with secular authority in a way that is perhaps in, in tension with our ideas of, of monasteries as being entirely separate from the secular world. But Norman then Angevin lords were associated with reform monasticism, so particularly um, the monastery the Cistercians benefited because the, the, the origins of the Cistercians was in were northern France, where many of the settler, the Norman settlers were from. And the, the, the foundations were made for a variety of reasons. Some no doubt were for purely religious reasons, other possibly for a, a blend of religious and pragmatic reasons. And I think it's this blend of religion and pragmatism that was behind the foundation of Revo Abbey. All monasteries needed um, land on which to be um, constructed and from which to gain um, the subsistence, whether they farmed the land themselves or whether they accepted the revenues from dependent peasantry. And you get land donation to mon monasteries from all across the, um, the social scale. When we begin, we, we, we get even peasants making donations to monasteries from the Anglo-Saxon period onwards. And it's these intricate relationships between um, donation to a monastery and obligation of the monastery to its patrons that tie the monastery and its patrons together for generations. And the, 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 ch the charters recording the donations, we get quite a lot of those from the Norman period onwards. We have few, few Anglo-Saxon ones, mainly. They, they usually are expressed in, in religious terms. But we know from other evidence, so for, for example, um, from archaeological evidence, that 
there may well have been different factors other than religious um, re religious um, motivations. And the ties between a monastery and its patrons could go on for generations. So, for example, this is this is a bit of a caricature, but it it reminds me to tell you about the case of um, Alan de Rydale, who attempted to claim some of the land that um, he had had been given to the monastery, and the monastery had one of its patrons um, do uh, enter into trial by combat. In 1170. So I'm sure this is this is not an eyewitness of drawing, but it's just a prompt to say this is trial by combat 1170 to defend Rivo's land um, from someone who, who was trying to encroach on it. Well, I, I, I like that. And there's a lovely, there's a lovely paper um, in a classic volume about that. Um, also in the north of England, we, we need to think about religious geography as well, because in this period we have a tension between to um, the Sea of, of Canterbury and the Sea of York, both of whom were trying to claim primacy in England. So there's, there's tensions, like north-south tensions going on as well. Also a period when national boundaries were fluid. So the boundary between um, England and Scotland was very, very fluid as an area across the Northwest known um, uh, in documents as the debatable lands, an area they went backwards and forwards in between um, England and Scotland several several times, and some monasteries um, fared rather badly um, in, in in that warfare. So, thinking more particularly about Cistercians, you can see from this that this is um, Cistercian order arose in what is now northern France. It extended then across all the way across from Europe, from, from Norway up there to the Levant. And it's this, it's this geographical spread that makes it, one of the things that makes it so interesting because it gives us a range of contexts. So it lets us think, was Cistercianism the same in the Levant as it was in England? Or what was it like here? So thinking about Cistercianism in the north of England and Cistercians in Britain. I've been researching Rivo Abbey, which is, which is there, which was the first Cistercian house founded directly from Clairvaux. It wasn't, it was only the third Cistercian foundation in England, but it was the first from Clairvaux, which was the home of um, charismatic Bernard of Clairvaux. Now Rivo was founded in 1131 to 32, um, and the founder was William, um, Walter Esbeck, who was a Norman new man. Um, and he, eventually, Rivo Abbey ended up with interests across the whole. Um, this is why I'm arguing for um, North Yorkshire to be included as part of, of, of Northern England, Paul, um, because Rivo had fold, holdings from the Upper Tees um, down to um, West Yorkshire, South and West Yorkshire. But its heartland was here, on the edges of the North, Yours, North York Moors. Um, and after it was founded in the 12th century, it then had the peak of, it, of, of the lands um, in the 12th century, um, and then remained powerful and a major player, both in um, the medieval church, but also in national and international politics in various ways. But I'd like to use the case of Rebo Abbey to examine some of the Cistercian myths. And these are, these are ideas about the Cistercians that have remained remarkably persistent, despite there being quite a lot of evidence to the contrary. So there are three, there are a number of these, these myths of Cistercians as occupying sites um, that were marginal or wilderness areas and then transforming these sites into, um, in, 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 into, um, in, in, into, into sort of shine um, productivity, that these 
selection of these so-called marginal sites and transformation into agricultural productivity. This was part of this this the, the, this was part of a conscious economic plan. Um, and that the Cistercian order otherwise shunned the wider world. Now, all of these threads kind of intertwine, so I'll try and unpick them a little bit. Um, this, the Cistercian order was one of the new monastic orders found established in the 11th and 12th century, which overtly attempted to return to the concept of the monastic ideal and the origin of the monastic ideal in the desert of the Near East. And this was partly in reaction to other movements in monasticism, such as the um, Abbey of Cluny, which gave an emphasis to the liturgy, which some in medieval ch church thought was inappropriate. And as we saw in the, earlier, and as um, David's example of Lindisfarne showed, um, even though we have um, the concept of a wilderness that arose in a particular context, by the time that notion came to Europe and to Northern Britain, it looked very different to the desert origins. So there's a certain amount of creativity required by a religious order who's trying to reconnect with a physical context which it cannot by its definition reproduce reproduce but the idea of, of, of desert being uh, of um, monasteries being marginal or set aside from lay life um, and going out away from um, the world to find God is one that you get in early medieval monasticism as well because of the writings of its and St. Guthlac um, in, um, in, in, in Eastern England very much stresses the idea of being away from, from settlement. So it's not unique to Cistercianism, but it's one that Cistercian writers particularly forward um, brought to the fore in their teaching because they thought obviously it had spiritual value in inspiring people. Um, but now we know that there was actually, in, in the way that Cistercians went about things, there, wouldn't there wasn't necessarily a great deal that was particularly distinctive to that order. Um, it's often stated that Cistercians were particularly um, effective at farming um, and certainly they were very cap they, 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 they very capably ran um, sheep farms, but also they raised um, cattle and pigs and um, Revo certainly had fisheries on, on the Tees. Uh, Revo um, raised horses and in the Tees, Tees Valley as well. So it's not just sheep, um, but Cistercians did have rights over very substantial areas of land. For example, in Ireland, Cistercian had over 500,000 statute acres of land. But sheep wool were, was what, what Cistercians were particularly famous for, and particularly the quality of the wool. And it was the sale of that wool that connected them through trade routes to the international network in things like wine. But there's also not very much to say that Cistercians were exceptional in their management of water. The things that governed what happened on a monastic site in terms of water manage, were, management were more to do with whether the monastery was in an urban or a rural site, because a rural site had more, um, they had more room to lay out and, 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 and they were less constrained by, by layout. Some other orders had to be perhaps more inventive. So, for example, the, the houses of the Carthusian order, so the places like Mount Grace in North Yorkshire, had to very particular um, requirements for water management in bringing water from a particular area to the individual cells. So, there's this em although there's this emphasis in Cistercian writing and teaching, and particularly in the writing of St Bernard of Clairvaux, and if you haven't read in any of St Bernard's writing, I would urge you to do so. He writes extremely well and, and communicates even, even to us in the 21st century. 
but my argument is that this, that particular belief in the northeast and El in elsewhere where was kind of refracted through a worldview in which the will the wilderness concept was theologically important but we need to set that we need to be conscious of that's a lens through which the medieval church was looking and that Cistercians weren't necessarily exceptional uh, in their agrarian and water management and the work I've done so far in Reba Abbey suggests that the first house first Cistercian house in the north of England wasn't did not transform its landscape or rather the, the, the area of land it may have transformed was very much smaller than has been previously claimed but that's a whole different session and I don't want to run on for too long on that. So just to recap, Rivo's monastic core was founded on a site that was not, it was not newly settled. This was land associated with uh, a vill that's recorded at Doomsday. Um, but we know, for example, um, about the work of St. Aelred of Rivo because Aelred himself writes beautifully and communicates extremely well uh, to people in the modern day. Um, and also there's, there's a biography of St. Aelred that talks about life at Rivo. And these are all these are all these are all writings which I urge you to look up if if, if you have if you have if you have the chance. Um, but we need to be conscious that these were these were work created in particular contexts for a particular reason. So archaeological work has um, a really valuable role in providing questions to ask of the theological writings. And the question I asked of the theological writings for Revo confirmed that the settlement, Rivo settlement was made into quite a complicated landscape. So this is just to give you an idea. I said that Walt, Walter Respect, the founder, was a, a Norman new man. In effect, he was an absentee landlord. He had, so this is the, this is the, um, the late 11th century um, territorial boundaries. So this is where at the time of doomsday, so it gives us a snapshot of, of what life was like before Rivo was there. So. Helmsley is where Walter Speck had his castle and he gave land just behind it and it ran just up there. That's the land he gave to, to be on which Revo was established. I'll zoom in. And the land which there's Helmsley there, land that um, Walter Speck gave to Revo was the villes of um, Griff and Tilston's there and the boundaries I've traced put them on this side. So this is Wapentake, this is an um, Anglo-Scandinavian uh, territorial unit. And he founded Revo just on that boundary there. So he put them on a border zone because somebody else held the land on this side. Somebody else was Lord on this side. Somebody else was Lord on that side. So it's my argument that Revo was founded, I'm sure part, there's partly religious motivation, but partly pragmatic and defensive one because by putting a Cistercian monastery right behind his castle there, he made sure that the descendants of the people who'd been dispossessed by the Norman settlement were less likely to be able to come and reclaim their land. And Revo's on this boundary there. And we get the same phenomenon a bit later on. And actually, and another thing, this is a broader question of, uh, apologies, for, it, it's a bit, um, bit fuzzy here. This, this is Revo's precinct there. And you see that the dots there, one, two, and three, these are features called the windy pits. And these are fissures in the, in the limestone bedrock. The currents of air come through the underground cave system and you can get a whoosh of sometimes warm air at, at, at the mouth of these caves. And we get, we get depositions, including some human burials here from Rung period onwards, but always on these north or not northeast facing scarp. There are lots of windy pits, but the only ones with depositions are these northeast facing ones. And I think it's interesting that Rivo's put right there 
right next door to that windy pit and not far from these other ones. So I wondered if there's something going on with pre-existing, pre-Christian traditions of this being a special place that was part of the mix of thinking it would be really quite good to have a, 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 a monastery here to make sure this place stays Christian. And we get the same, comp the same picture of very complex set of factors behind um, supporting Rivo Abbey in another major um, patron, Henry II, who came um, to the throne in 1154. Um, he, he came to the throne when he was only 19, after a period um, when his mother should have been rightfully the Queen of England, but Stephen disputed the, cr the crown of Matilda and he, so Stephen was king instead of um, Henry's mother. So Stephen was king. So Stephen eventually agreed to uh, Henry II becoming his heir and Henry became heir in 11, uh, came King of England in 1154. But he inherited an England that had been in this period, sometimes it's called civil war, sometimes it's, been, it's called the anarchy, but it's certainly a very turbulent period in which he had very stretched resources. He, his, his base was still northern France. He had very stretched resources in the south of England. So he, he had to make sure that the north of, Engl north of England remained under his control, but he didn't have the men and man manpower to put up there. So he I think he came to an arrangement he, that he discovered, I don't know how, but perhaps somebody, some, some, um, as Walter Esbeck, perhaps had friends at court who advised the young king. But anyway, Henry II gave a major area of land in his um, his, his manner of pickering to the monks of Rivo, which later on in the 13th century we then um, have references that the areas carrying. Um, is, is, is turned into arable and is, and is productive. And it's always been thought that the monks of Revo reclaimed the pickering, um, pickering waste from primary marsh. Now, I will, again, I won't go into the details, but I think I've proven that the area that pickering, that um, Revo brought in from primary wetlands was very much smaller than um, we previously thought. Um, so we have this picture of monastic patronage as defensive plantation by Henry II as well. Um, we have the two accounts of, of this area in a doomsday being waste. Um, and in Henry II's document, it's also referred to as waste, but I think the second reference as waste is what we, we um, think of as geld pardon. He was, it's a tax pardon that the monastery wasn't liable to pay tax. Also is this image again. So. Here we have Pickering Marishes there. That's the um, River Derwent comes like that. It comes, flows off the North York Moors south. Because that area was blocked by um, a, a moraine and uh, the remnants of an, of an ice sheet there, the, the drainage is forced inland. It, it's forced westwards. And I wonder if we, that's the westwards flowing, the backwards flowing is the reason why the, we have, get this cluster of early medieval monasteries in the Vale of Pickering. I don't know, I've got no way of proving it. But anyway, this is the land that was given by Henry II to Revo. And this was ultimately turned into um, several granges by Revo Abbey. But I think Henry II's motivation for giving the land to Revo was complicated. And after Henry uh, made the gift, the proof that the land wasn't um, wait, well, was not valueless was that several people, including the local um, magnate, contested Rebo's right to the land. So most of Henry's gift was not new, um, was not marginal. So that's been a whistle stop. Apologies, that's about on time, Paul, isn't it? About on time. So a whistle stop tour through medieval monasticism in the north, northeast sort of. Um, but I wanted to emphasise really, as, as, as we're thinking about what else to be thinking about in terms of belief and this part of the world, 
the themes that come out to me are, are questions of context and of diversity and change. And it feels as if we're at a really interesting place where we, with, with David's work, think rethinking um, Linda's farm, with the work um, that, that my colleagues will, will present to you in the next few weeks. We've got some interesting themes already emerging about belief and the North. And I, I, I'm sure that we'll get similar related suggestions of diversity and change, but also the importance of context. And, and I, I'm, I, I'm certain that, that um, Sarah Semple will also mention context because Anglo-Saxon Northumbria is a particular context. And I think that's an argument, this part of the world does have some special things that de define it and i wonder if we're getting closer to what is it that defines this part of the world and the beliefs here <laughs>